Let's dive into today's session. Amazon has pioneered e-retail by innovating, listening to consumers, and pushing boundaries to be known as Earth's most customer-centric company. With the acceleration of digital and the constantly changing consumer landscape, how can CPG companies achieve profitability and growth? I'm pleased to introduce Ed Landry, Consumer Markets Transformation Lead with PwC, who will lead a discussion with his colleagues on strategies CPG companies can use to elevate their e-commerce business. Ed, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, good morning. Thanks for joining today's webinar. It's nice to have everyone with us. Uh, as Sarah said, my name is Ed Landry. I'm a partner from PwC's DC office. I work with senior executives on sales and marketing strategy and transformation. And I will be facilitating today's discussion on e-commerce and growth. I'd like to uh, introduce my colleagues, Jeff and Nikki, who will be sharing their expertise on three specific topics uh, today. One around funding for profitability and growth. Uh, secondly, around chargebacks and supply chain optimization. And lastly, around better practices for trade and marketing spend. So uh, Jeff is a, a managing director out of our Seattle office and the leader of our marketplace practice. He is a former Amazonian and agency owner with extensive experience in leading e-commerce, marketplace, and, market, and marketing strategy with a specific focus on end-to-end um, -end e e-commerce and Amazon enablement. So welcome, Jeff. Uh, Nikki, Nikki is a director out of our Indianapolis office who focuses, whose focus is on corporate and business strategy. She is also an Amazon alum as well and has a wide range of experience uh, helping clients develop strategy and capabilities to optimize and accelerate omnichannel sales and marketing. So welcome, Nikki. So we have, we've packed a lot into the three topics that we'll cover today. Please send any questions through the chat and we'll, we'll try to get to them towards the end of the session. So our first topic is around funding um, and, and growing or restoring profitability. So Nikki, let me start with you. You know, when I hear the word e-commerce, I immediately think of uh, D2C and Amazon as part of the ecosystem for most CPG brands. You know, Nikki, I guess the question is, is there more to it? And, um, you know, what is top of mind for you when you hear the phrase? Yeah. First off, Ed, I wanted to say hi to everybody and really excited to be here today. Second off, Jeff and I are both Amazon alums and we go back many, many, many years. And this is both a, a, a topic that we're very, very passionate about, especially the last couple of years, right? E-commerce has now really become a very big topic. Um, for CPGs. It's growing rapidly. And I think an increasing, you know, taking an increasingly larger percentage of the business. And also since e-commerce, right, we're seeing massive channel prolifer proliferation, um, you know, sort of accompanied with this rapid growth and new and exciting business models. Um, so a result of this, right, as well as sort of trying to manage cost to serve and, and set the foundation for growth, I think it's just becoming more and more complex for CPGs to manage it. So really, when I think about restore profitability or drive profitability or, you know, claw back at profitability, which we hear a lot um, from many of the folks we work with, I think of three main levers that organizations can impact to drive um, profitability. And I think the first thing is SKU and or unit economics. Uh, the second is supply chain operations. And I think everyone, you know, typically tends to go there first when they're having issues. And the third one, which is becoming increasingly more important is trade and marketing spend, specifically as we see sort of the boom of retail media marketing. Um, and I think, you know, we'll cover all three of these topics in more detail. Great. Thank you, Nikki. Jeff, what uh, what comes to mind uh, for you on the topic? Uh, thank you, Ed. And as Nikki mentioned, um, her and I actually go back. We worked at Amazon together 10 years ago uh, and have stayed in contact. And here we are together again, bringing the band back together. Uh, super exciting. Great topic. Um, I want to echo what Nikki said, right? The e-commerce ecosystem has gotten very complex um, with the proliferation of players, you know, across different categories of retail. And as Nikki mentioned, new business models, that complexity is putting pressure on getting the fundamentals right, you know, in this, in this channel. And so it's across different trade partners and across the totality of the ecosystem. And that requires us to respect the unique nature, um, you know, that this channel has, its behavior across these different dimensions. So if we pick up on those themes. Yeah, SKU and unit economics, it's for you and it's for your trade partners. You know, supply chain operations that are agile and flexible to respond to the demands within the channel. And as we talked about earlier, right, trade marketing and spending, we're going to get to that a little bit later. But again, tailored to the channel, tailored to your partners, designed for, for growth. 
And so these specific dimensions, right, um, are forcing a different perspective on cost to serve within the ecom channel. It's nearly impossible to apply, I think, the same tactics and the same economics of brick and mortar retail to the channel, which is often where we start. And I think that's where we get hung up, you know, as uh, as an industry is is how do we, you know, how do we create unique perspectives and unique applications to these specific to the channel. Yeah, and I, I I certainly see that struggle playing out in the market, and we've all worked with brands to solve it. Nikki, let's talk a little more about unit or or SKU economics. Jeff mentioned that it's important to kind of understand this for both the manufacturers and the trade partners. You know, what should we be considering as inputs to unit economics or SKU economics, and and how should we be thinking about our trade partners in this equation? Yeah. You know, Ed, maybe before I dive into the answer, I just want to point out that few organizations, and we actually kind of look under the hood, are actually, you know, managing or measuring profitability at the SKU level. I think most folks are still sort of sitting and looking at it at the brand level, because that's traditionally how we've looked at our P&Ls. Um, the problem here is that e-tailers are looking at it at the SKU level, and so we sort of need to adapt uh, and shift there. Um, so I guess back to your question, right? Why should we care about the unit or skew economics um, and the profitability of our trade partners? You know, first and most importantly, e-tailers have their own model for how they look at profitability, and it's different across any one major e-tailer. Um, and so before you know you set your unit economics, you need to understand how that partner is going to look at the profitability uh, of their business and really bake. Um, their profitability requirements into your uh, profitability waterfall. Then, right, then I think you can take a look at your own requirements um, upfront, you know, before we even get into setting a price uh, within the channel. And then understanding both these factors, you can set the right profitability waterfall. Um, that's going to set the foundation for, you know, trade funding and vendor negotiations, because we know most of these vendors are going to come back year after year, right, and want more. Um, so we'll give you sort of the margin um, and the foundation to make sure that, you know, you, you can maintain your growth. So we typically refer to that as pure profit margin. Um, and you'll hear Jeff and I, you know, talk about, you know, that term throughout the webinar today. It's also important to remember that you, unit economics for brick and mortar, as Jeff mentioned, are not the same um, as brick and mortar, and we really can't treat them that way. So as we start to kind of break down, right, I'm visualizing my waterfall here, which I've drawn so many times, uh, you know, for various you know, clients and stakeholders throughout the years, right? <laughs> um, we really want to think about, you know, market retail and then work backwards so that we can actually get a holistic view of what profitability looks like, not only for the brand manufacturer, but for the retail. And then we want to net out to COGS or wholesale from there. So that's going to include all your fixed or non-variable costs um, that you, you know, maybe you can impact, maybe you can reduce those over times by implementing different sort of tactics like moving to drop ship or, or something along those lines, um, you know, pick and pack. Um, you know, as well as sort of other, you know, contracted spends were applicable. One thing I want to point out here is I didn't mention marketing. And I think this is something that we'll unpack uh, later, because I think most people are like, look, I'm spending a marketing on the platform. It's on the platform. It drives to a sale on the platform. And therefore, I want to account for it here. The problem with that is it, it causes an inflated cost to serve. So I'm not going to go too much more into that. I'll leave that there and we'll come back, um, you know, to trade and marketing a little bit later on. Thanks, Nikki. But what, what I'm hearing from you is that before thinking about trade funding and vendor negotiations, we should first understand SKU economics in a, in a pretty detailed way. And I know, as you mentioned, for many CPG brands, it's very hard to get to SKU economics. It can be hard. Um, and there's definitely a tendency to, to run a portfolio P&L and use that as the basis for negotiations. Um, so with that, Jeff, can you just talk a little bit about why this is a challenge for e-commerce profitability? You know, Ed, as we mentioned before, you know, many brands take the approach of applying the pricing economics of their brick and mortar retail businesses to the e-commerce channel, but then finding out that some of their highest volume SKUs, which are profitable on the physical shelf, are actually unprofitable on the digital shelf, which then drags, you know, the net profitability of the entire either trade partner or the channel down. And this is also true for D2C businesses, um, as well as Amazon, Walmart, Target, you know, all the other, you know, big players and partners that we have there. Um, 
the challenge I think is that's not uncommon to find wide variance in gross product margin, even within the same product family. And that's often due to variability of COGS, again, within the same product line, right? Making line pricing very difficult. Line pricing at wholesale, line pricing at retail can be challenging. And then, you know, the pick pack and the ship fees in e-commerce are determined by volume and weight of the product, not its selling price or not its actual value, um, which can lead to high fulfillment fees for, you know, low ASP products and or um, low margin products, which makes them even more unprofitable in the channel. And then finally, you know, trade partners are making purchasing and funding decisions based on SKU level profitability. So yes, they do look at the total portfolio, um, but what drives the way they order the individual products in your portfolio are based on the profitability of that specific uh, product. So you can see changes in the SKU and volume mix based on that profitability that might further erode profitability because you had you know, planned and managed the business on a specific set of product mixes, and you're not actually seeing that because of the way that your trade partner is ordering. Yeah, I've I've come to understand that the margin requirements of brick and mortar retail can be very very different from the e-commerce channel, even when the retailer you know operates in in both channels. I guess the question is is there a is there a formula for how most e-commerce partners calculate brand profitability, and if there is, you know how is a brand to approach vendor margin requirements and, and vendor funding. Ed, I think this is the million dollar question, right? That that most CPGs are asking um, today. And I think people are spending a lot of money using AI and other tools to almost try to create these. I think the problem is that most of these e-tailers have their own specific margin requirements. So that makes it really challenging. There's not a silver bullet here. Um, the second thing is that they'll be dynamic as market conditions change they too will change those inputs and factors that they're going to look on. So the rate, the, the weighting, right? The propensity model um, that drives their internal um, algorithms. So as you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to understand not only the model, I don't think maybe the methodology of how they think about it, right? I think it's less important to actually get the individual weightings, but just more generally how they how they actually think about this. Um, and, and then, you know, kind of think, think through, right, um, how they work back from pure profit margin, um, you know, what are their fixed costs, I think, if you know, your product dynamics, I think a lot of people can actually go in and, and sort of estimate what the fixed fulfillment costs are going to be and get a good average around that. So you can take a look and, and sort of, you know, net out where you think you might land from a profitability perspective before you even set up the products on anyone. Um, of these of these platforms. And then I think the, the most common things is, you know, when folks come back and they're getting requests from their e-tail partners for additional vendor funding, funding, these these requests are typically to recover lost margin um, due to either unfunded programs, right? I think a lot of folks will start in an un, unfunded pro program and I'll use subscribe and save as an example of that. And then once it becomes really, you know, um, big, then the the e tail of what you know will often come back and say, okay, look, we've got to switch this to now a funded program, or right. I think this is sort of the elusive one. Um, either increase in costs in supply chain, and then price matching. So everybody has now moved to dynamic pricing, um, and so as we sort of see prices drop, um, we're seeing sort of margin compression due to price matching on these platforms. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Jeff, is it is it fair to say that most vendor funding requests are due to poor retail profitability? And I think that's often the case. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, it's one of the primary inputs to how most of the e-commerce trade partners operate their business, which is why we're advocating getting at the SKU or this unit level diagnostic and also a deep understanding of what their margin expectations and requirements actually are. Now, this work often reveals issues and challenges in the price pack architecture. Uh, and I, we got to be honest, right? Um, most brands have copied and pasted the retail price pack architecture to the e-com channel. And, you know, that's opened up the Pandora's box of channel conflict with pricing, you know, large profitability issues, you know, downstream. And as we've discussed, right, the cost of serve for e-commerce is, is different. And in some cases, it's higher than traditional retail, uh, which is why poor retail profitability is often what drives the vendor negotiations and their request for, for funding is because they're not getting the margin they need, you know, on the front end of the business, uh, much less covering the fixed cost that Nikki described on the back end of the business. Nikki, any anything to add there? 
Yeah, so I'll come back to, I have my million dollar question. Now I think we got to address the 8,000 pound gorilla in the room here, right? Which is really going back to my original point on the price matching and dynamic pricing and price transparency. So I think as you start to do business in these channels, you're essentially living in a glass house. That's the way that I would think about it. Um, pretty much all major e-tailers are running price matching bots and they're looking across channels that sometimes we don't anticipate. I mean, even printed circulars. So I think it, it, it truly kind of creates transparency into pricing holistically. But ultimately, this is putting pressure on retail margins. Um, so when you take a look at, you know, lower retail margins, add the higher costs to serve, you have an instant press, uh, recipe for low to no profitability. Um, and this is actually what Jeff Bezos termed as the infamous race to the bottom. Yeah, so I think I think makes sense. So I think we said a lot here. So let me just sum this up. Um, th three main takeaways, I think, at the highest level. Uh, one is we should know the skew economics for our business and our trade partners, and that starts with retail and kind of works backwards. Um, secondly, I think I heard we should understand trade partners' margin requirements and how they are calculated. And each each trade partner does it a little bit differently, for sure. And then thirdly, um, we should create a profitable price pack architecture for the channel. Um, do I have that? Do I have that right, Jeff? Would you add anything? You've got it right, Ed. And maybe I'll add one nuance to D2C, which I think is important to understand. Um, that you've got to start your D2C business at market retail pricing and set your margin expectations accordingly. Customers have a perfect knowledge of pricing, right? And as Nikki mentioned, price matching is everywhere. Um, and that includes your own site. So the reality is that MSRP will not fly in a D2C business. You're going to have to be competitive with all the other places that your products are being sold, which puts additional margin compression on D2C businesses. I, I, I agree with you, Jeff, there, but I think it's also, you know, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that it's not easy to do this, right, for most brands. Um, I think, you know, many folks are either doing this manually they're doing it on an ad hoc basis, but ultimately, you know, you have to almost do it in real time. Um, and I think I mentioned earlier, many are actually, you know, using AI, creating new tools and processes to be able um, to manage this. I think there are models that exist in the market today that can sort of be leveraged and, and tools and tech out there. Um, so you don't have to go it alone. You don't have to build it from scratch either, but it's almost becoming sort of a, a table stakes requirement now to be able to get these inputs um, and the data and then know almost instantly what levers to pull in coordination with each other. You know, um, it, it's not good enough to go and say, look, I'm just going to look at, you know, supply chain because I'm getting chargebacks and think about how I fix packaging. If I'm not going to look holistically across, you know, my plethora of levers and, and think about the combination and how to pull them um, at the right time. Excellent. So I think those are, those are great comments, a great way to kind of conclude the funding for profitability and growth question. Um, so let's talk about supply chain and logistics. You know, I, I personally recently had a client who was experiencing a pretty high level of chargebacks from both e-commerce as well as kind of brick and mortar trade partners. Very frustrating experience for them, for sure. You know, and as we all know, this is, this is not an uncommon experience and often, you know, but it is often a drain on profitability and it's also creates headwinds for channel growth. So Jeff, can you, can you talk about what makes the e-commerce supply chain unique for CPG brands? Ted, I, I really enjoy and love this topic. Uh, I have a geeky fascination with the supply chain in general, but I've spent most of my career focusing on the e-commerce supply chain. Um, and what makes it, I think, unique is we have to start with the last mile delivery experience that we've all you know come to know and love. You know, Amazon certainly pioneered it, but everyone has piled on. It's become the table stake for what we expect as consumers in engaging in this channel. You know, Walmart, Target, Kroger, everybody, right? Fast, free delivery. And in some cases, same day. In some cases, literally yesterday, I had a delivery within an hour of the time that I placed the order. Um, so to deliver that type of experience um, requires an incredibly agile and efficient infrastructure, as well as very sophisticated forecasting ordering systems on the part of the trade partner which puts then pressure on you know, us as vendors to be able to adapt and understand you know, how to play in that world. The downstream effects you know, on brands are 
more frequent and often smaller orders to multiple fulfillment centers, um, which you know puts stress on our supply chain. We're used to sending bulk orders, you know, to one or two places, and we're not doing that anymore. And that's compounded by often an opaque forecast from our trade partners. So something they give us great visibility into exactly how they're going to order, when and where, um, which again puts the burden on us to adapt to that dynamic nature of the forecast. Um, and then, you know, it's a very different experience and expectation, you know, from supplying a distributor or a large scale brick and mortar partner. And so most brands struggle to adopt, you know, ad adapt their logistics processes and systems to meet these new business requirements specific to the e-com channel. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Nikki, your thoughts on the topic? Yeah, I think the big thing is just, you know, we're obviously seeing growth everywhere and, and for e-tailers specifically and, and retailers um, across the board, you know, they're implementing measures to kind of keep up with that pace and that the need to deliver same day, right? Um, and, and that really comes down to more automation. So we're seeing this higher level of automation um, across logistics networks. Um, you know, with receiving really being the first touch point of that. And why do I mention receiving first, right? I think that as the product's coming in, you've got to get it into the e-tailer fulfillment centers, right? Distribution centers as quickly as possible. But the minute that that product comes in and it requires the human intervention, you're going to be liable to receive an infraction chargeback, right? And that's directly related to profitability here. So super important. And I think, you know, the break point for most brands is, is really sort of one, the pick and pack, um, you know, on the brand side as orders are actually coming into uh, DCs. And then the second part is the really stringent labeling requirements um, that are kind of changing, right? I think we, we saw one that just changed uh, labeling requirements two months ago. Um, so we're just constantly seeing, you know, these different, you know, sort of labeling requirements, um, you know, coming down, down the pipe. Um, I think, you know, outside of that, what, you know, what folks are sort of, you know, doing there is, is also these shortened, you know, ship windows. And so the ability to get it out very, um, quickly and meet these requirements, um, you know, they're, they're having to change systems and processes because traditional ways of fulfillment are not going to work. So new OMS, you know, warehouse management configurations are going to be required. The requirements are not always easy to understand. I think, you know, they don't come with sort of a user manual. Um, and then for most retailers, it's pretty much 100% self-serve. So I think, you know, a lot of folks have sort of left, felt like they're left navigating um, this space a little bit in, in the dark. But I think once you get through it and you get everything set up accurately, um, or you get help to do it, I always say don't go it alone, um, that, then it can work pretty well. Yeah, a lot of unique considerations. I guess I guess the question, Jeff, is so, you know, given that, how do CPG brands get ahead of all these requirements? And, you know, is there a way to, to turn this into some sort of, you know, competitive advantage, if you will? And I love that phrase, competitive advantage, because I think that is a real opportunity. I think that's the good news here. I mean, yes, it sounds dire and it can be very challenging, uh, but for brands that can actually get ahead of it and, and you know, kind of leverage and appreciate the complexity and get good at it, it is a true competitive advantage. So I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, we look at the major trade partners that we've already discussed, you know, Amazon, Walmart, Target, others, right? they all measure supply chain and score supply chain performance, you know, of their vendors. And they use those scores as inputs to determine among many things, like exactly where and how your products are going to show up on the site and how they're surfaced to customers. So think about supply chain excellence as a seed to better search results, you know, better buy box control, which leads ultimately to, to better sales. Um, they also use those inputs in their preference on who they source from. Because if they they you know can't get a good experience from you, they might turn to one of your distributors you know, to get your products or give up on your products and turn to a competitive product, right? So supply chain excellence gives you preference in vendor sourcing, which again can be a competitive advantage um, against those that aren't so good, right? Um, and then maybe the final one is that ultimately this leads to a discussion of how they think about profitability and funding requests on your behalf. Because if they are suffering from delays in receiving, delays in or or inaccuracies in receiving, which you know limits or um, or stunts their ability to get the products to shelf, that costs them real money, and they're going to want it back. So ultimately, it really drives you know the totality of how um, the trade partner wants to work with you, um, and again in real competitive ways, brands that outperform their peers then receive you know preference preferential placement on the site. 
right? So you'll rank and search, and you know, all things being equal, above your peers, um, increased order frequency, and overall more favorable funding treatment. You know, so the path to get ahead of this is you've got to learn to just embrace the complexity. Uh, honestly, most brands that I've worked with, they want to fight it. And they want to complain about it. And I get it. We need therapy and we need to kind of vent a little bit, right? But ultimately, we've got to learn to just embrace the complexity and understand that the industry is moving in this direction. And if we can get in front of understanding the specific requirements and build these very efficient processes and enable the right systems and the right teams to meet these requirements, we end up being ahead. And that turns into a true competitive advantage, which you'll see in increased market share, and increase sales velocity. I think that's I think that's very clear. Thank you, Jeff. So, Nikki, um, what else uh, is there that that you know CPG brands should be considering as they as they think about turning the supply chain into a, an advantage? Well, I, I, I mean, retail readiness, right? And I think it's like an elusive term, but the thing is that most brands, I think when we say retail ready, they think about consumer facing content and copy, right? And everything to sort of drive the front end, drive search as, as Jeff mentioned, but they don't think about the actual physical product and the product information that's needed to be retail ready. Think about the way we bring products to market. It's typically done in a way to take products to a brick and mortar, you know, shelf and not actually launch into a digital channel. Now, I do think a lot of folks are actually doing, you know, innovative things around launching products into digital first, right, to be able to test. So I think that that's actually a really great tactic here. Um, but the main point, you know, I want to make here is, is really around making sure that you're retail ready, and that is having the right product information, the right pack out, the right pack level identifiers, um, and, and then really thinking through how you can eliminate all these extra steps and processes that are sort of needed to get in compliance with those retailer requirements um, that, that Jeff had, you know, sort of mentioned earlier. So I think brands who invest in setting the foundation and getting this right up front are really in a unique opportunity to accelerate growth and take advantage of, you know, all the great things that a lot of these, you know, retailers on their platforms have, right, um, to offer. Excellent. Thank you. So Jeff, Nikki, before we move away from chargebacks and supply chain optimization, anything else that we want to we want to talk about? Or are we covered most of the what we want to do? Um, you know, let's let's disentangle maybe chargebacks a, a, a bit deeper. Ed. I think there's two buckets here that we can think about, right? Chargebacks tend to fall into two flavors, right? There's invoice shorts. So, you know, your trade partner is essentially saying we didn't get everything you sent us. And so we're going to, you know, back out items that are missing, right? Invoice shorts. And then there are infractions. So these are, you know, bills you're getting for the violation of some, you know, system process or something you didn't do right. Um, we, we, we have to make sure that we understand um, that these are related, um, but one kind of comes before the other. So I want to focus on infractions first. And ultimately, we need to understand, you know, what is the source? How do we architect the solution? Uh, so let's discuss this, you know, a little bit of detail. So nearly every trade partner publishes their requirements and expectations around order processing and fulfillment. And they're usually fines associated with violation of any of those things. Now, those can be hard to find. Sometimes we ignore them. Sometimes we don't even know they exist, but they do exist. Um, and we need to start there to understand exactly what do they expect us to do around timeframes and, and, you know, and, and specific requirements around pickback. Um, and then what are the consequences of violation of these? Uh, <laughs> once these requirements are understood, right, then we can build process around this. So to give you some examples, you typically see requirements around the time to accept POs, um, the fill rate on those POs, and the accuracy of how those POs are being managed. So there's a whole set of requirements around that. And then on the fulfillment and the receiving side, uh, we'll see requirements around um, the timeliness of routing uh, freight, if that's something that, that needs to be done, either your internal network or your trade partner's network, uh, you'll see requirements around freight ready. You'll see requirements around receiving accuracy and all around the pick, pack, and the labeling uh, of those orders. Um, so the first step is that, that we recommend is to you know, clearly understand you know, what these are. So when you go to a root cause analysis, you can identify where the failure points are. Um, so usually it's going to be around the missing of a timeline or the failure, you know, to meet a specific performance step or procedure. Um, 
And we often find that the teams that are tasked to manage chargebacks are not the teams that are actually doing the work. Um, and that can be one point of failure or one point of disconnect in, in how to get it managed and how to eliminate it. Um, is that if you've got finance folks that are trying to troubleshoot chargebacks, um, those are not the operational folks that typically are the reason why your chargebacks are happening in the first place. So getting the right people to be looking at it is really important and aligning those teams around what are the expectations around their specific job functions, making sure that you've got processes designed to meet those requirements, and you've got checkpoints along those processes so that you know when things are not happening well or things are falling apart. Um, we recommend an approach you know, that starts with creating, again, a process around chargeback management. Uh, so it starts with a clear understanding of the requirements and the expectations of your trade partner, knowledge of how to understand the chargeback documentation. So someone needs to be able to determine, hey, we just got this invoice and it's got, you know, $50,000 with the fees on it. And there's, you know, a hundred rows of entries on this document. How do you disentangle that and understand where to send it within the organization to try to troubleshoot? And then that final step is validating performance along the way, not waiting for the chargeback to occur, but have in-process validation so that you know that you're you're following your own processes, identifying failure points as they come up and that can be magnified through getting a chargeback, um, and then mapping the corrective path forward. So it's kind of a continuous improvement loop of constantly looking at what process do we have, how are we engaged with those processes, looking for feedback from you know your trade partners, and they will give you feedback on how you're doing independent of getting charged back. Almost all of them have a dashboard that reports your performance metrics along these areas. So you can see up front where you're starting to have difficulty before you get into a chargeback situation. And then finally, you know, what is the remediation path when you do have these problems? There are actual instances where the chargeback is not valid. Um, and so you also need to have a process for dispute. Um, and again, understanding the exact requirements of what your trade partner is going to demand from you from the standpoint of documentation and proof will help get um, the um, dispute process you know, well-oiled and efficient. Um, it tends to be a lot of back and forth, um, and there is conspiracy theories that say that the trade partners use the chargeback as a way to backstop margin. I don't particularly buy into that conspiracy theory, but I will say that the mechanisms that they give us to work with them are very primitive and feel like it's intentional. Well, there, that's good. There was a lot. There was a lot there to digest, uh, Jeff. Um, so I think if I if I distill it down to to the three points, I think I'm hearing first, you know, understand specific partner requirements. Um, second, I, I think build the processes and configure this, you know, the systems to support those requirements. And then third, you know, companies really need to create a specific process to manage chargebacks. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of what I took away. Three big. There's some more details to wrap around those as well. But Nikki, anything else we should we should be adding to this discussion? I mean, we we could have a whole webinar on this discussion, Ed, right? <laughs> but but I think I want to just take you know this idea of retail readiness that I you know mentioned earlier and kind of come back to it, but then add on retail readiness includes the right process, right? So I think we do need to really think end to end what the optimized you know processes. And so if we kind of go back and summarize, right, what Jeff had mentioned, there's really chargebacks are really caused by two types of issues. Um, they could be recorded as many different things. And yes, we have to play detective and go figure out what the root cause is actually. But essentially, it really boils down to issues with incorrect data or product information or how that information is being transferred from system to system to person. I think the other thing is just human error, right? And it's really because of band-aided product, brand-aided process, um, or just, you know, complexity that we've created trying to, you know, take a process that was intended for something else and apply it um, to this type, uh, you know, of environment. So I think if we can simplify that, it maybe makes it easy. One, we'll have less chargebacks to deal with. And when we do, we have a process to deal with it. Um, and and less time spent, right? Trying to get to sort of the root cause, um, you know, of of how these things are created. I think the other thing I wanted to add here, just around retail readiness, is a topic that we hear. I'd be remiss if I didn't say it. That come up all the time around packaging, right? And it's really around inners. If I, I get the question all the time, we're getting chargebacks. You know, it's around 
you know, problem receive around inners, right? We know it's inners. What should we do? We've done this. We've done this with labeling. We've done all this stuff. There really isn't a silver bullet for this one, right? Especially when we're getting to belly bands and some of these other complexities. And so I think the simple rule of thumb here is design your product and your package the way you want to sell it. So if you're not planning to sell an inner carton, don't include an inner carton. I know that's always easier said than done. Um, but I think if you know you are looking for sort of the silver bullet, then simplify, simplify the process and simplify the packaging for the channel. Okay, that's great. I think that all makes sense. Um, one last question on supply chain for both of you. Um, what are we seeing or hearing with regard to future proofing the e-commerce supply chain? Jeff, maybe we start with you. And I I see a lot of trends, but there's one that I'm particularly fixated on right now um, that I'll, 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 I'll use to answer your question. Um, and that's really the, the prevalence of omnichannel. I feel like that we're, we're, we're going back in time and pulling it forward, right? Omnichannel had a moment and now it's kind of resurfacing again, but maybe this time it's for real. Um, and the, the reason that I'm picking on omnichannel is that it is putting tremendous stress on you know, two components of the supply chain. So let's think about what Omnichannel is doing, right? Customers are demanding it. They want to be able to interact um, in different ways with products and with retailers. And so, you know, think about the proliferation of the Instacarts and the DoorDashes of the world. Um, think about, you know, Bopus and what's that doing in terms of putting additional demand on in-store inventory stock levels. Those models are rarely forecasted, if even able to be forecasted, into the supply model of brick and mortar retail. Um, but they tend to originate in e-commerce, right? And then the the demand flows through to to brick and mortar. So we're seeing kind of this convergence of you know inventory management, order management, and forecasting um, driven by the prevalence of you know omnichannel, which everybody wants. Um, so you know stress on forecasting, stress on fulfillment across all sales channels. So I think the real opportunity for future proofing of the supply chain or one, because uh, I know Nikki has another one um, and they're not mutually exclusive, right? I mean, you can invest everywhere. Um, but my advocation is spend some time and energy thinking about what does dynamic forecasting mean to you and your organization across all channels. Uh, that could be a great area for CPG investment that will, again, lead to future proofing of the supply chain because it will inform changes you know, all downstream. Um, and once you can get a handle on, you know, where customers want to buy and how that's going to manifest across your channels, you can get the right products in the right place at the right time. Yeah, so I, th I think my, my point is going to be really around that, the right product part component, Jeff, right? So I think, mm -hmm. you know, we mentioned earlier, we're not, we're not seeing the automation and warehouses slowing down any, anytime soon, right? I think they're actually more and more of these retailers are productizing their offerings in this space and it's sort of proliferating through pretty much all of retail. So I think it's going to become the norm um, for everybody as, as, you know, all the big players are pretty much running autonomous autonomous infrastructures at this point. And so what, what does that mean for CPG players, right? I think a big area of investment going forward is really going to be around retail ready packaging and pack out um, and really thinking through the process, right, of how you're going to manage with, without creating skew proliferation, right? But I do think it's looking at your channels holistically and then determining where is the right product in the right pack out, right, with the right information um, to boot, right, to kind of get it right going forward. Great. Thank you both for that. So with that, I'd like to take our discussion to the third and final topic for today, which is around, which is a good one, which is around trade and, and marketing spend. I think I can uh, pretty safely say that every CPG brand wants to see profitable growth from the trade and marketing spend. Um, but it's it's often a pretty elusive, you know, goal. So Nikki, I guess the question is, um, what considerations should brands apply to the allocation of marketing and trade spend in the e-commerce channel to, you know, to attain this, this goal, if you will? Yeah. So I think there's components of the spend that, you know, might be similar to brick and mortar. So we'll try to draw some nuances there and then some that are completely unique to the e-commerce channel and should be treated very, very differently. Um, and so I think, you know, if we draw an analogy to brick and mortar, I think we could take trade spend as an example there. So the typical buckets of trade spend, right? Your co-op, your early paid discounts, promotions, damages and returns are pretty consistent across the majority of channels. 
Um, and I think, you know, those buckets should be accrued and allocated as such, right? So those could be sort of more of the norm across how you look at, you know, those that funding across your channels. I think where we see a deviation from the norm is in areas of freight. Um, and that's because there's a difference in how many of the retailers we've worked at. We'll take, um, you know, a couple of, of retailers like Amazon um, will actually do, you know, you, you pay, which means they pay and they'll come and collect the product from you. So there's a lot of different ways that this can kind of work, which, which causes a little bit, diff uh, you know, uh, of uh, a, a different sort of allocation there. Um, and then, um, you know, I think freight, though, should be included in COGS or, or attributed to your SGNA expense. Um, but I think where it gets a little bit different and more interesting is in some of the vendor programs like subscribe and save, merchandising placements, and advertising, especially as more of these retailers are launching into retail media platforms as well. Um, so I, I think, though, you know, most brand manufacturers are starting to realize that these uh, marketing activities are actually investments and should be treated that way. I think brand marketers are starting to allocate budgets very wisely um, to these types of spends. So it's either shopper marketing or retail media marketing versus allocating them to your cost to serve. Because as I mentioned earlier, this is going to create an inflated cost to serve. And I think a lot of people, when they're actually looking at some of these channels before, they're saying, gosh, it's so unprofitable. But when you actually unpack it, you know, then I think you can actually get down to the true drivers, um, you know, or, or issues, right, that are, are causing, um, you know, issues within profitability. Um, so I think another consideration here is when allocating and sort of applying the media mix, we want to be able to take a holistic view across it. So when we kind of move it over to that bucket, then we can actually take a look at all of these investments, you know, subscribe and save, merchandising, advertising, you know, with the broader marketing mix model and take a look at performance. And then we can reallocate and kind of shift spend according to performance versus sort of looking at it in a very siloed methodology. I think that's really interesting. Is it is it um, too much to say that you're recommending a couple things? First, it sounds like spend on Amazon, subscribe and save. And then secondly, um, merchandising and advertising should be, you know, allocated, budgeted, measured, optimized through through marketing, not the account. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, Ed. And if if you're a CPG brand that has a product that fits the subscribe and save model, that is somewhere something that you should be doubling down on. Absolutely. Excellent. So, so let's let's take take on the topic of performance of these investments and the measurement of them because we have always have lots of questions about that. Uh, Jeff, I keep hearing about you know return on ad spend and total advertising you know advertising cost of sales as the gold standards, if you will, for for marketing investments on Amazon, Walmart, even other retail media networks. So where are your thoughts on, on the measurement of marketing and, and advertising spend? Ed, you know, these measures, while interesting, right, are like super high level, um, high level, you know, of, of indexing performance, right? But I, I don't think they're actually very useful. In fact, I think they're insufficient uh, to be useful in directing and the use and the optimization of very specific, you know, tactics to actually drive incremental growth. And, and so I think we, we we tend to run off the rails on uh, over-indexing on them and we miss the forest for the trees. Where I think there's real opportunity, you know, to drive true incremental and profitable growth um, in, you know, in this channel um, starts with where we started our discussion today, right? If we apply the, the lens of skew and unit economics, that gives us a clear understanding of where we should be making investments to begin with. Because it's, you know, clearly, you know, not profitable to advertise on a non-profitable item, right? We're just kind of digging the hole even deeper. But it's shocking how many brands actually do this because they don't understand fewer unit economics. So maybe that's the, the first thing that we need. Let's re-index how we think about the totality of the application of, of marketing and advertising dollars and maybe do it from the bottom up, right? So we start at this few level and, and we work ourselves up. Um, you know, we need to focus these investments on incremental growth. And to do that, I, I advocate um, that we apply a cost per acquisition and a conversion rate model to the marketing and advertising investments that we're making at the SKU level. So let me unpack that just a little bit. Um, you know, if you know the lifetime value of a customer for a very specific product in your portfolio, you could then set a budget for what you'd be willing to pay to acquire that new customer. 
right? Based on the profit that you'd make on that customer. So that that value, right, becomes the target for your cost for acquisition budget. Maybe that's the upper bound of it. Using that as your budget guardrail and then applying a rigorous filter of conversion um, against not only the tactics that you're using, but the products that you're going to be advertising against, um, that yields the most efficient and the most truly incremental spend that you can possibly deploy. Uh, so I'm slightly oversimplifying this, but actually not by much. Um, this is a little bit of math geek work, right? But it can be done and it is being done today uh, by some of the more progressive you know, brand marketers. Um, but the most meaningful measures in my mind um, are measures that drive specific behavior in support of very specific outcomes, which is why I kind of land on cost acquisition and conversion rate, because they do exactly that. Yeah, If you laser focus on the calculation of those values and the tracking of those values across your products and your tactics, uh, you will get exactly what you're looking for. Um, notice that I didn't mention ROAS or tacos, right, in any of that discussion. Again, I think those might be useful at the, the highest level, um, but those can be gamified in ways that don't actually lead to incrementality. And, and I see that behavior, you know, across the board. I won't mention names, but it, it's very easy uh, to get a ROAS that you want without actually delivering any real value in the activities that are underneath it. Uh, and so that's why I don't particularly care for those, those measures. Um, I believe, again, in outputs, right? Um, and ROAS and TACOS are outputs. They're not inputs. The inputs should be CPA and CR, you know, um, cost acquisition and conversion. There are other things. I'm not saying ignore other stuff. I'm just saying that if you laser focus on the things that matter um, as inputs, you will get the outputs that you're looking for. Yeah, that's very interesting, though. So let me put this in terms of a hypothetical. If I knew I could make a hundred dollars, you know, of profit on each new customer for product, you know, product A, if you will, and I was yeah. willing to spend, say, twenty dollars to get, you know, each new customer, you're you are recommending that I use the twenty dollars as an input to my marketing and advertising, and optimize the tactics and and products for conversion. Is that right? Yeah. That, that's exactly right. And I'll, I'll, I'll add on this a little bit, right? If you're actually hitting your, you know, your target of $20 or maybe even less, you should be willing to spend an almost unlimited amount of money um, on those activities, right? Until you reach the inflection point of conversion, right? There'll be a point where as spend is increasing, conversion will keep growing, but then there's a point where it stops growing and it actually starts to decline. That's the inflection point, the top of that curve. So you should be willing to spend as much money as you, you can, right, until you reach that inflection point, because that's the maximum point of efficiency on that particular tactic um, or, you know, or, or advertising strategy. And this is where I think, you know, we, we miss it as an industry. Um, yeah, I'm implying unlimited budgets, right? And, and I guess theoretically it could lead to that. Um, but what I see more often is brands that, you know, fail to keep spending to that point and they stop before they reach it, which is mean they're leaving money on the table. They're leaving real growth on the table that they could have afforded and would gladly have paid for if they had indexed their performance in a slightly different way. Unlimited budget. No CFO wants to hear that. <laughs> but uh, but but I guess seriously, Nick, Nikki, we all know that the CBG space is is you know uber competitive for for marketing and advertising. I guess given what we've said and and all that we've discussed. You know, what insights, you know, can you share about, you know, trying to realize growth through these types of investments? I think you're on mute. I, I you got go. you. There you go. All right. Yeah. Um, you're right. It, it's becoming, you know, a more saturated and more competitive space. Um, like we had mentioned earlier, especially with sort of the proliferation of retail media um, and everyone trying to jump on that bandwagon for all the obvious reasons. But I do think that there's still opportunities out there for brands that have the right methodology and approach to this. I think it really lays in, you know, we talked about setting the right foundation, getting retail ready, and that's everything, you know, from content um, you know, through supply chain and packaging, we call it the brilliant basics. So get the brilliant basics right, get retail ready. Um, lay the right data foundation, I think is the second point uh, that's really important. And we're seeing many invest in AI algorithms and models to help with the process here. And then I think the third thing, which is probably the most important is dare to be bold. Uh, so try things, experiment, um, 
fail fast, um, you know, partner with, you know, your, your retail partners um, strategically. Um, maybe that's a topic for another webinar at some point, but I, I think if you kind of do all three of those things, obviously in the right mix, and maybe we're oversimplifying a little bit, I think you can stand out in the crowded space. There's still opportunities um, for brands out there to, to win and differentiate. Wow. Well, we've, we've covered a lot today. I think um, Nikki and Jeff, thank you so much for your time and insights. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, both of you support CPG brands, you know, with all of the things that we've discussed today and, you know, would be happy to chat with anyone, you know, about specific challenges. Um, and I guess lastly, just a big thank you to the Consumer Brands Association um, for hosting this today. And with that, let me go ahead and turn it back to Sarah. Sounds great, Ed and Jeff and Nikki, thank you so much for, for joining us today. So this is the Q&A portion of today's session. Um, as you said earlier, if you do have a question, uh, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A chat function, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll start off by, by asking one question. And um, so you worked with brands and going back to the first topic that we covered, sort of balancing that transparency and pricing between the, the e-commerce platforms and some of the brick and mortars. Um, are, are there just, are there companies that are doing that right? Are there categories? You know, we, we work with CPG companies across the board from food and beverage to household and personal care. Um, and there's always some unique challenges depending on what that end product is. So just your opinions on, you know, is it easier in one realm or the other, or is there a certain sector that does that better than, than others? Uh, Sarah, maybe I'll, I'll start this conversation. I know Nikki will, will, will add additional clarity. Um, I do think there are folks that are doing this better than others, but I think it's more the approach than is it category specific or, you know, or whatever. And so the approach that we're seeing that's most effective is really starting from, you know, across all channels, you know, pricing in market to your trade partners and really relying on a unified pricing strategy and taking, you know, a lot of the incentives that typically show up as off invoice and turning those into more MDF type funding mechanisms so that you kind of level the playing field, right? Where every trade partner is getting, you know, same price in market and they're getting specific funding that is unique to the tools and capabilities that they offer you as a brand, you know, to drive growth. Um, and that, that it's hard to do, right? It requires kind of a, a either a very slow and thoughtful approach or a scorched earth approach to reset pricing and market. So I, I'm acknowledging this is very difficult, but those that are doing it and some have are seeing, you know, it, it level pricing at retail. So they get very stable pricing at retail. And more importantly, their investments are actually working to drive real growth, not just disappearing into the coffers of retail profitability, which, you know, is important, but let's be honest, right? If we're going to put money in market, we want to see it grow the brand. And the only way you can do that is by investing in things that actually have proven ability to grow the brand. Nikki, what, what would you add to that? I mean, I actually think it's it's kind of table stakes now. I know we're seeing brands do it, but I would say there's more urgency around it than ever, right? Especially on these platforms where you see retail arbitrage, right? And so I think if you want to build that brand protection, you really have to look across your channels and that's into B2B as well. Really any avenue where your product um, can surface and think through your distribution models. And I think that's actually the hardest thing is actually going sometimes to your distribution contracts or other things and having to take a look at those and say, wow, what would that look like if that product showed up over here, right? Or doing the analysis to say, how is that product showing up over there, right? <laughs> have, I not got the, have I not got the unit economics right somewhere else? And, and that's a big issue with profitability, not, not to belabor it, but a lot of times when we dive into what's causing the price matching, it's where is that product coming from? And you'd be surprised, right? Where it's coming from. It's file sales in a different channel that end up, you know, making its way, um, you know, into e-tail. Super helpful. Thank you. Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing any more questions. So I'm going to go ahead and say thank you one more time um, to join, for joining us today. And a big thank you to PwC for their continued support of the Consumer Brands Association. Uh, we have several other industry insight sessions scheduled in the coming weeks, so please visit our events and education page, and I think we'll go ahead and provide a, a link in the chat so you can view those sessions and register. So thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.